Coming up, a loving son makes his mother's long-awaited dream come true. Now she can say she was a proud. Put a smile on my face and an imprint in my heart. Plus, a man travels thousands of miles to South America to be reunited with his mother. Family's family, you know. She makes me a peanut butter jelly sandwich or, you know, presents me with a piranha head and say, eat this. <laughs> a reminder that motherhood takes all different forms. I miss mom. But you're not really his mom. Yep, I miss mom. And finally, we take a look at the fierce competition for world's greatest mom. Each kid could have a perfect mom for them. Ooh, I like what you're thinking. All that and more on this special Mother's Day edition of On the Road. Hello, I'm Steve Hartman. Thanks for joining us for our CBS News streaming series, where every month or so, we take a look back at a few of our favorite stories from my 25 years on the road. If you ask me, we should make every day Mother's Day. But since 1914, the U.S. has formally celebrated moms, grandmas, and maternal figures of all types on the second Sunday in May. In this special, we're taking a look through the On the Road archives at stories of amazing moms and the children who look up to them. First, we introduce you to a Florida social worker whose life changed when she decided to bring one of her trickiest cases home with her. Take a look. From all four walls, success smiles down on 50-year-old social worker Connie Going. These are just some of the more than 1,000 Tampa Bay area foster kids she has helped match with adoptive parents. Every child is adoptable. There's a family for every child. And it's your job to find out who that family is? Yes. But when you get a kid like Taylor... <sighs> that heavy sigh punctuates a 10-year struggle over this kid. For 10 years, Connie tried to help Taylor get adopted, to no avail. It was always somewhat my fault. Yeah. But I didn't know I didn't realize that, you know, when I was growing up. Neglected by drug addicted parents, Taylor and his two sisters entered the foster system in 2003. This footage is from a local news segment aimed at trying to find the siblings an adoptive family. And eventually they were adopted. Someone took all three, but then gave Taylor back said he had anger issues. So how's it going? Connie eventually found him another family, but they returned him too. Same reason. I was just so mad because I thought that they weren't going to keep me. I was just trying to test them. But they were going to keep you. Yeah, I know. When you feel you're not lovable and you're up against, you know, someone's loving you, that's a pretty scary thing. Throughout the whole process, Connie never gave up believing there was someone out there for Taylor, someone who could see his potential and help him realize it. But after that second family returned him, she stopped looking. All I could think about was how he was feeling and how he was blaming himself again. Connie says she felt so bad for Taylor, she got this ache, this physical ache in her stomach. But it was a pain that came with an epiphany. She says she realized right then and there, she couldn't be his caseworker anymore. The next day, she made arrangements to drop him as a client and take him on as a son. He'd looked all over for somebody to parent him. And that was me. Their adoption was finalized last summer. Connie, who's divorced with two biological children, welcomed her first boy with open arms. Of course, Taylor still had his anger issues. That mirror in the bedroom didn't break itself. But most of the madness stopped a few months ago after Taylor told Connie he was running away from home. And he'd go, I'm leaving, I hate this. And I'd be like, I'm not sending you away, Taylor. And he'd look over at me, take his backpack off and go back <laughs> in. <laughs> and then I'm like, yeah, this is where I belong. She knows my worst side and she still cares about me and still loves me. I put mom because I couldn't fit Connie. <laughs> Sounds like someone's adopted <laughs> I took it a new attitude. After adopting Taylor, Connie adopted another boy, Davian. Taylor actually knew Davian. They used to live in a group home together. But now, thanks to Connie, they're joined as brothers too. The teenage years can be rough for both parent and child, but not so in the case of the family you're about to meet next, where a grateful son found a way to make his mom's wish come true. Take a look. For most of the seniors at Waterford Kettering High School outside Detroit, 
prom is optional, but not for Donatus Smith. Every time this kid even suggested not going, he got a lecture from his mom. She always bring up the story. You know, she always start crying. You gonna do everything that I been able to do. Belinda Smith grew up dirt poor. Her family couldn't afford to send her to prom. Every day I came home from high school, I cried because I wanted to go. That's why she vowed Donatus would have the opportunity. And that's why she was so disappointed when it seemed like he wasn't going to take it. Every time she asked him about prom, he was evasive. Until about a month ago, when he finally came clean. I said, well, what's wrong, Donatus? And he said, well, I want to ask you if you want to go with me. You? Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, I go. <laughs> I said, heck yeah, I'm going. When we gonna start looking for stuff? It's like, all right, we gotta start looking for the dress now. Donatus helped his mom with every step. And on prom day, he got in the car he borrowed from his aunt, drove around the block, and got back out to pick her up. Corsage and all, just like the date she always dreamed of. And I told my husband, I said, I love you, but you know what? I think your son just outdid you. You know, I just had to tell him that. The kid really did do it upright. She was looking good, like, you know, she was beautiful. She was gorgeous. Of course, there are disadvantages to bringing your mom to prom. Stop chewing that gun. Like getting parented on the dance floor. You better move your hips. Boy. I'm moving, I'm moving. But that's the truly amazing thing about Donatus. He didn't care. On this night, when most kids want to be as far away from their parents as possible, he had the courage, and you know it took courage to make this her moment. <laughs> now she can say she went to prom. Put a smile on my face and an imprint in my heart that's going to last me a lifetime. Whoever said you're only young once obviously never had a son who believed in second chances. Hey. That's certainly a night neither he nor his mom will ever forget. And probably the rest of the prom goers too. When we return, a remarkable story unlike any I've ever told. The story of a separated mother and son whose reunion took decades and thousands of miles to complete. You won't want to miss this one. Welcome back. Thanks for being with us. Now I want to share with you a story that borders on the unbelievable. It took us to South America, and it will take you on one son's journey from resentment to understanding to finally appreciation. Um, it's a nice family photo. You'd never know. You'd never know, looking at old pictures of David Good's mother, that she was anything other than a typical New Jersey housewife. This looks like at the beach at the Jersey Shore. In fact, David himself never really noticed. Sunglasses, she's just hanging. Did you recognize that she was different than other people's moms? When she left. Before that, I don't remember being cognizant of the fact that she was this Amazonian jungle woman. Now, she was just mom to me, you know? David's mom, Yarama, grew up 3,000 miles away in southern Venezuela near the headwaters of the Orinoco River. This is Yanamama territory, home to some of the most primitive and isolated tribes people on the planet. I studied the Yanomami over a 12-year period. David's father, Ken Good, is an anthropology professor at New Jersey City University. So take notes. While doing his field work back in the 70s and 80s, he lived in Yarama's village, basically became part of it fell in love with the people in general, and one person in particular. Yeah, that was a little uh, unexpected. He and Yarama were betrothed and eventually moved to the States. Ken says for Yarama, that was an unimaginable journey. You know, we got to the airport and I'm getting the bags and over here some guy starts up a Jeep and then she, I found her hiding in the bushes. She thought, she thought it was an animal. She thought the Jeep was an animal? Yeah, the headlights, the roar. Then it started moving, but she never saw a wheel, uh, how a wheel works or anything like that. 
it was like she went through a time machine or through a portal and went through a whole different cosmos. And every artifact, every ment effect, every socio fact of this culture, of this realm, was absolutely foreign to her. And I couldn't imagine just what that was like for her. She didn't know the jungle ever ended. Nope, she thought the whole world was the Amazon jungle. And, you know, when my dad said, you know, let's come to my village of New Jersey, she thought she was just going to another Shabano, you know, another, another Yanomama village. Considering all that, she seemed to adapt pretty well to this alternate universe. She and Ken had three children, and Yarma was an excellent mom by all accounts. And yet, after six years, during a visit back to the jungle to see her family, Yarma told Ken she just couldn't go back to America. And she didn't. How could she leave her kids? Ah, the eternal question. I've had more comments, particularly from women. Who can't understand? No. How do you look at it? I look at it as the, the, in the in, in, intolerable situation for her. She said people weren't meant to live this way. What did she mean? Just the idea of in an impersonal world, walking by strangers all the time, and a lot of them weren't even so friendly. That was not within their um, cognition that that's a way to live. Ken, the professor, was able to intellectualize it. The two youngest were able to move past it. But David, who was five at the time, never got over his mom's leaving. I internalized it as uh, abandonment as a kid, yeah, and um, felt like it wasn't good enough for her. In school, when kids asked you, where's your mom, what would you say? That my mom had died in a car crash. That was the most effective response because then they, didn't, then they stopped asking questions. And why didn't you want people to ask questions? Because all my friends' moms drove them to soccer practice, you know, picked them up. What's my mom doing? Oh, she's naked in the jungle eating tarantulas. So, like, I was... <laughs> I guess that's understandable yeah, when you put it that way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, oh, so David pretended his uh, mother never existed. I, I just wanted to be a typical American kid. It wasn't always easy. For example, he remembers going on a class field trip to the Museum of Natural History in New York City. It's just yeah. bad luck. Their guide just happened to take them to the section on South American tribes. Of all the sections that we could be visiting. Just happened to show them an exhibit on the Yanomama, which just happened to include a picture his dad took Here it is. of his mom. Bam, right in my face. David says he did what any embarrassed 10-year-old yeah, would do. I think I ran around this way, and I just found like a dark corner somewhere and just hid there until the rest of the group caught up. Yeah. Imagine like every day, every single day, you know, are people going to find out, are people going to find out, you know, I just, you know, that it gets to you after a while. Eventually, that nagging worry evolved into a total hatred for his mother. Until one day, while in college, he came across a copy of an old book his dad published back in 1991. It's about his mom. And just reading it, just finally getting to know her, <laughs> flipped a switch. It just, the floodgates opened, complete 180. I went from absolutely detesting my heritage to being completely proud of it. And I knew that this day was gonna come. I knew I had to embark on this mission, on this quest to go back and reunite with my mom. It was a quest much easier dreamt than done. The nearest landing strip is still three days away from the village. And there are no roads to it, only rivers. With rapids, you have to go up. Oh, man. And after all that, there was still no guarantee he'd even find her. The Anamama can be nomadic. Yeah, she could have been long gone. But fortunately for David, she was here, ready and willing to pick up right where they left off 20 years earlier. I made it. Put my hand on her shoulder, and I was so nervous, and I couldn't talk to her. She couldn't talk to me. And then all of a sudden, just remembering that comforting feeling of having a mother, and that's when I just, I broke down and lost it. They both lost it. Mother and son spent the next few weeks hunting for crabs, gathering plantains, and reminiscing about the old days back in New Jersey. One thing David didn't do was ask her why she left. Says he didn't need to. He says over the course of that visit, which was in 2011, and a second visit last year, he has come to understand perfectly why she had to be here. They don't experience loneliness. They don't experience anxiety. They're teaching me how to be human. They're teaching me how to live. To that end, David recently launched The Good Project, 
It's a nonprofit based on the campus of East Stroudsburg University in Pennsylvania, where David is working on his master's in biology. He says the project will serve as a bridge between the Yanomama and the rest of us, mainly so we can learn from one another. Of course, this project will require many more visits to the Amazon, which is fine by Yarama. Before he left last time, she told him, it's hard on me when you're gone so long. Don't take so long before you come back. David says, not a problem. Someday I'm not going to have a mom. And I just spent two decades of, of rejecting my mom. So uh, I want to embrace every opportunity, every moment to be with her and hang out with her. Your story is its truly unique. It's one of a kind. But there feels like there's something universal in it. Family's family, you know. No matter if you know she makes me a peanut butter jelly sandwich or you know presents me with a piranha head and say eat this, you know. <laughs> mom's a mom. So mom's a mom, no matter what. <laughs> yeah, yeah. David is still running the Good Project and continues to fund programs that assist the Yanomami with health and education. He hopes to return to see his mother again this year. Now, after a short break, we'll head to Freeport, Maine, where a little girl is a mother in her own right to an unexpected creature. Stay with us. Welcome back. Thanks for sticking with us. It's time now for one of my all-time favorite stories. And I know if you're a fan of On the Road, it's probably one of your favorites too. This one reminds us that moms and their babies come in all shapes, sizes, and species. A lot of kids go to the park to see ducks, but eight-year-old Kylie Brown of Freeport, Maine, takes her duck to see the park. As we first reported a few years ago, Snowflake goes into the pond and then returns when called, because Snowflake truly believes that Kylie is his mother. And the duck is not alone in this delusion. I'm his mom. But you're not really his mom. Yep, I'm his mom. How did you first find out? That he was a duck? No, that... <laughs> Kylie is unbearably cute. <laughs> and since I never did recover to ask that question again... <laughs> Let me just tell you that Kylie first noticed Snowflake's attachment the day the Browns brought him home. Look, 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 he follows her. For whatever reason, the duck imprinted on Kylie and just had to be by her side, no matter what the hour. <laughs> when Snowflake refused to stay in the backyard, Kylie's parents, Ashley and Mike, say they had no choice but to give him a diaper and make him a house duck. He goes everywhere the ducks are allowed and almost everywhere they're not allowed. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you've ever had a two-year-old or a four-year-old that wouldn't leave home without its blankie. She, Anxiety. Uh, yeah, she would not leave home without her duck. On, and at that point, nothing's negotiable. Snowflake! Snowflake goes to the beach in summer and sledding in winter. He's been to soccer practice, gone on sleepovers. He even went trick-or-treating as Olaf, the snowman from Frozen. And over time, because they both sincerely believe they belong together, Snowflake and Kylie have formed a bond like most of us will never know. It's special that I know that that's the type of person that she's going to be. Since we first told this story in 2016, Kylie has gotten even more motherly. She taught Snowflake how to read, or at least not eat the words. Speak away. She also taught him the value of community service, signing him up to be a therapy duck. And, of course, she knows just what to do whenever her little one needs help falling asleep. Kylie really is going to make a great mom someday. Mostly because she always has been. You know, someday he's going to grow up and go to college. What? I couldn't imagine a better mom for Snowflake. Duck, human, or otherwise. Coming up next, we'll dive into the competitive search for the world's greatest mom. Don't go anywhere.
Welcome back. A few years ago, my kids and I cast a worldwide net to try to find the world's greatest mom. It was a surprisingly difficult task, but eventually we figured it out. This is the award for world's greatest mom. It's a statue of a man for some reason, but it's still an impressive title. Which is why the Oz Engraving Company in Los Angeles cranks out nearly 10,000 of these trophies every year. That means at least 10,000 kids know the world's greatest mom. I thought my kids knew too. I mean, it's always been obvious to me. But when I invited them into my office, cameras rolling, to record their choice, they were stumped. We have absolutely no clue who that is. No clue whatsoever. No clue It's whatsoever. the world's greatest mom. It could be in Africa. Finding her would be a needle in a haystack, they said, but suggested I start by reaching out to our Kindness 101 students and on-the-road educators to see if we could find any kids who think they know the world's greatest mom. We're looking for the world's best mom. Yeah, yeah that's ours. What makes your mom the world's best mom? Our needs are met before her needs are met. We talked to more than a dozen kids. She plays games. And each one gave us a very convincing reason. She always helps me. Why their mom is the best. <laughs> she tucks me in at night and she's very loving. She has a really big heart. She deserves the mood, but she would never ask you for it. That's sweet. My crew was impressed, but still hard pressed to pick a winner. Did you hear the kids say anything that your mom didn't have? I actually didn't, no. So how do we reconcile this? Each kid could have a perfect mom for them. Ooh, I like what you're thinking. That's true. Maybe that's why they make so many of those trophies. Everybody has the world's best mom for them. It was a light bulb moment that led to a hallmark moment. In my almost 10 years, I feel like I have adapted to think that this mom is the best mom. I can see the card now. Dear mom, I have adapted to think you're the world's greatest. She's going to love it because she loves everything about them. And that's what makes her one of the many world's greatest. Why is this a man? <laughs> so that's our special for today. To all the world's greatest moms and grandmas in our audience, we wish you a very happy Mother's Day. For brand new On the Road stories, don't forget to tune in to the CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell every Friday. Until then, I'm Steve Hartman. Stay kind. Mm -hmm.